This video series will explain how to conduct a level one assessment under the revised total coliform rule. The series is geared towards transient non-community water systems that do not require a certified operator. This first video in the series gets you started on the process and focuses on the sampling portion of the assessment. First, who conducts a level one assessment? A level one assessment must be conducted by personnel qualified to operate and maintain the water system. In the case of transient water systems, this may be the owner, a maintenance worker, plumber, or an operator. As you can see, a level one assessment does not need to be conducted by a certified operator. DEP created an assessment form to guide you through the complete assessment process. You are required to use the DEP form to conduct and submit the assessment results. To download the form, go to the RTCR website at tinyurl.com slash PARTCR2 as shown. The address also appears in the video description. Once at the site, click on the link and it will take you to the form and instructions on the e-library. The first link is for the instructions as shown. The second link is for the Word version of the form. Each time you require an assessment, please download the latest form from the website. DEP continually updates their forms. Before you get started, gather together the sample information for the positive samples during the month that triggered the assessment, such as the chain of custody forms, lab result sheets, and sample logs if you have them. Let's get started on the assessment. Here is the DEP Level 1 form. If you trigger a Level 1 assessment, you must complete the form, which is also a tool to guide you through the assessment. In Part 1, you are asked to fill in basic system information. You can see we've done this for an example system called Jeff's Java House. Let's move to Part 2, in which we'll investigate the positive sample information that contributed to triggering the assessment. In Part 2, a separate table must be completed for each positive coliform sample. Let's look at one of the positive sample information tables in more detail so you can see what to fill in. The first two boxes, which are sample location ID number and sample location, should be the same as the location ID and location specified in your total coliform sample siting plan that all water systems should have submitted to the department by April 1st, 2016. As an example, I've completed this for sample location 701. For the next set of information, positive sample date, name of sample collector, and chlorine residual, you should be able to find it on the chain of custody form from the lab or the sample logbook for your water system if you maintain one. Again, I'm simply showing an example of completing the form on screen. The three questions below this sample information are there to determine if there were any issues in any of the sampling practices used to collect the sample. If you were not the sample collector, it is essential that you speak with the sample collector in order to answer these questions. The first question asks if you collected the samples in accordance with your system's sample siting plan. As I mentioned, this is the plan that all systems had to submit to DEP by April 1st of 2016. You have to be sure to use the monitoring locations and time frames identified in the plan. Question 2 asks if the condition of the sample tap was appropriate and question three asks if the samples were collected in accordance with proper protocols. For information to help you determine how to answer these questions or to help you ask questions of your sample collector, you can review the helpful video at the link listed in the video description or by going to YouTube and searching for RCAP Coliform Sampling, RCAP Coliform Sampling. They put together a good video on proper sample collection. Now let's move on to part three, which is called Sample Issue Descriptions and Corrective Actions. So how do we know what is a sampling issue? Well, you would have identified sampling issues in part two. Let's take a look back at part two. Anything in a gray checked box in the positive sample information is considered an issue and needs to be addressed in part three. So you can see here in this example of part two, they had checked no to question number three, which is a gray box. 
This indicates that samples were not collected in accordance with proper sample collection procedures. Now we know we have a sampling issue and we go back to part three. For our example, we would indicate the issue in the top of the table as positive sample number one and question number three. Now below the first line, there are two additional boxes, the sample issue description and the corrective action and completion schedule. Let's look at the sample issue description. In this box, the assessor would explain the problem. So if you recall, in our example, the issue is that samples were not collected in accordance with proper protocols. In our example, the system described the issue in part three as shown. The aerator was not removed from the kitchen sink prior to sampling. The next and final box that needs to be completed in this table is the corrective action and completion schedule. In this box, you identify how you are going to correct the sampling issue. You also identify your time frame or schedule for getting it corrected. Let's look at what our example system wrote. Only two individuals collect the coliform samples for our system. We have reviewed the RCAP coliform sampling best practices video. We have written out our own sampling protocol document. As part of the protocol, the aerator will always be removed. The protocol is already being followed for all sampling events going forward. If you are watching this video series for the first time, please continue to Tutorial 2, which moves to the assessment questions on the water source or sources.